special guest today, Monish Pabrai is a computer engineering graduate from our school who decided to take his talents in the financial side. In 1991, he founded his own IT consulting firm with a little over $100,000 and would go on to sell it in the year 2000 for $20 million. Today, he's the managing partner of Pabrai Investment Funds, a family of hedge funds inspired by his mentor, Warren Buffett. Mr. Pabrai is also a published author. This book, The Dondo Investor, talks about his influence in his investing style and is full of fantastic information on value investing. We'll be raffling away a few copies of it to make sure you stick around for that. Please just take a second to double check your mic's muted, and if you'd like to turn the camera on, you can do that as well. Uh, Mr. Pabrai, thank you again for taking the time out of your day to speak to us. The floor is all yours. It's great. Doing well. So would you like to do this as a pure Q&A, or would you prefer me to make some introductory remarks, and then we open up to questions. What do you prefer? Whatever you prefer. If you have anything you'd like to say, and then we can some students up here. Okay, you. I'll just uh, speak briefly, and then we can pretty much uh, talk about whatever you have on your mind, and we can talk about what I discussed, or we can go anywhere. So that's good. It's been 35 years since I left Clemson. It's hard to believe it's been that long. Feels like yesterday. And I was just talking to Chris. It sounds like some of the buildings aren't there anymore, but I think most of them are. And I had a wonderful time at Clemson. I had just come to the country as a foreign student, and I had three wonderful years at Clemson. My degree is in, is in computer engineering, and I actually took quite a few, as many as much as I could. I maximized the courses I could take, the accounting, finance, econ, business courses I could take. So I spent a lot of time in Serene Hall, and that was also wonderful. And my journey from Clemson to becoming a value investor and a fund manager kind of took some left and right turns by the time I got there. And one of the things that was a kind of a seminal time for me was I heard about Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger for the first time about eight years after I left Clemson. So it was in 94. And that was actually... A a seminal moment for me when I heard about them and I started to read about them. And I was really intrigued in terms of their approach to investing and such. And I didn't have any degrees in finance or anything, but had a decent grasp of accounting and such from some of the classes in Clemson and so on. And I was really interested in Buffett's approach to investing. And his approach was very different from what was done by most of the mutual funds and so on. So I started to apply his approach to investing in 94. At that time, I had just sold a small portion of my business. For the first time, I had some money. I had about a million dollars in my bank for the first time. And I started to invest that money. And this was in 94, 95. And I think by 99 or 2000, that million, over 10 million investing had gone really well. Also, the markets were actually in, had given me some very strong tailwinds as well. And then a bunch of friends asked me to manage money for them. That led to the creation of Pabrai Funds, which has now been running for about 21 years. And last year, 2020, so 1994 and 1995 were years of maximized learning for me because I was just trying to pick up everything about Buffett and Munger and Berkshire Hathaway and so on. So I felt like I was drinking from a fire hydrant at that time. And last year was the second biggest year of learning for me, maybe because sitting at home, contemplating my navel with nothing else to do, maybe that's why. And so it was, most people would like to forget about 2020. I think from my vantage point, 2020 led to some wonderful insights and I'm going to make the journey from here on that much more interesting. A couple of things that I ran into in 2020 is, one is there's a good friend of mine called Nick Sleep. Some of you might've heard of him. If you haven't heard of him, what I would recommend is that you go to God Google and enter Nick Sleep partnership letters. And uh, they're floating around on the web and there's about 13 years of letters. He ran a very successful hedge fund and uh, he shut it down in 2014. And now he's just a gentleman of leisure uh, doing quite well. But there are, there are some tremendous insights in those letters. And those insights were so strong that they caused me to make significant changes to the way I invest. And the other thing that happened also last year is I read a wonderful book and I can't recommend this book enough. It's called 100 to 1 in the Stock Market. 
and it's written by a guy named Thomas Phelps. And this book actually came out in 1972. So it's about 48 years old, but it's really timeless. And Thomas Phelps is a very gifted writer. And he did a really good job in terms of explaining a bunch of nuances. So one of the things that Nick Sleep talked about was that he said, look, Walmart went public in 1970. And from 1970 till now, which is more than 50 years, the Walton family has held the stock. They haven't sold, they've just held the stock. But there have been no public market investors that have held the Walmart stock for this 50 year period, or even a 40 year period, or even a 30 year period, maybe even not even 20 years. You might be able to find some 20 year holders. And so what Nick Sleep asked is that if you owned Walmart stock in 1970 or 1980, what exactly was the facts that caused you to sell it? And it's an important question to try to answer. And the flip side of that same question is that if you owned a Kmart stock, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, what caused you to keep it? So Kmart on a number of metrics was a very cheap stock, but it was a business in decline. And Walmart on a number of metrics was an expensive stock, but it was a business that was growing and going from strength to strength. So I used to always invest until here with the idea of buying things well below what they were worth and then selling them when they got to full price or maybe a little bit over full price. So buy a dollar bill for 40 cents or 50 cents or 30 cents. And then as it approached a dollar, get rid of it and find another 40 cent or 50 cent dollar. And that, that's worked quite well. I think at Pabrai Funds, every dollar we started with turned into about $14 in the last 21 years. And that's after fees and expenses. But it's a inefficient kind of treadmill way to go through life. What is vastly better is if you can identify great businesses which have great economic characteristics and very long runways ahead and hold those businesses for a long time without being particularly concerned that they may be somewhat overvalued. If it's a really good business, it will probably get optically overvalued periodically, maybe for a long time. And I know Nick Sleep in his one of his recent emails to me said to me, he said that Monish, the best investors weren't investors at all. They were entrepreneurs who never sold. And so the idea is that we should think of ourselves as if we were the founders or the family that owns or runs the business and have the same mindset as them. And as long as the business is improving, as long as the moat is widening, as long as things are getting better, we shouldn't be focused on valuations and such. Of course, if things get egregious, if you're a family who owns GameStop right now, you should have sold a while ago. But beyond that, I think that, so that's a pretty significant mindset shift for me. But I think it makes life easier. I think the returns are better. The taxes go way down. So I've gradually started making this shift in my portfolio. So... With that, we can open up to your questions. They can relate to what I talked about or uh, anything you have on your mind. We can discuss anything you'd like to discuss. And I hope you appreciate that I painted my office orange and I wore my orange merino shirt because it's the best color on earth. So thank you. So you touched on it before we came so briefly. What do you make of the short squeezes that are going on right now in the market with retail investors? And do you think this will come to a horrible end for them? Or do you think that this is almost a new wave, if you will, and that they will have more of a role in our markets for years? Oh. Okay, I got some of it. So you're, were you asking about GameStop? 
Right. I'm asking about um, GameStop and just the short squeezes that are going on specifically in general in the market right now. What do you make of that? And do you think that this is... I mean, I think the thing is that auction-driven markets have a basic characteristic that they either overshoot or undershoot on the actual value of the underlying business. So let me give you an example. So let's say I own an apartment building a block from the Clemson campus. I rent it out to students. And if I go to a realtor and say, hey, what's my building? The realtor might say, oh, your building's worth a half a million dollars. And if I go to the realtor the next day and say, hey, what's my building worth? She'll say, listen, dummy, it's still half a million. Okay. And then if I keep going every day to the realtor, I'm going to get pretty similar answer. And of course, he or she is going to get frustrated with my persistent questioning. And then maybe in six months or a year, they might say, oh, there's been a change. It's the comps have changed a little bit. It's 505,000 or 510,000, something like that. Right. So when you have an intelligent buyer and an intelligent seller, buying or selling an asset, usually those prices tend to be quite rational and they tend to be very close. Now, if I take, just imagine that we, are, we have a newspaper which is publishing just stock quotes for all the stocks in the New York Stock Exchange, for example, and they have the name of the company and they have the high and low price for the year and the current price, okay? And I throw a dart at that stock quotes page any random company that it hits, what it will show is that the minimum price for the year was $30, the maximum was $70, and the current price is like $55, for example. Okay, the min-max range would be at least a two-to-one difference, 30 to 70, 50 to 110, that sort of thing. You'd see a pretty wide range. And the business value has not changed by that amount. It is the nature of the way the prices get set in auction-driven markets that causes them to have much wider fluctuations than what I would see if I were trying to sell a home a block from Glems. If I sold the home in January or October or March, it wouldn't make much difference. It'd all be almost the same price. And because of this nature of auction-driven markets where it's, Ben Graham said the markets are a voting machine in the short term and a weighing machine in the long term, we're going to get distortions. In fact, the, it is because markets are auction-driven that I can make a living doing what I'm doing. If they did not have this characteristic where prices deviated from intrinsic value in some pretty significant ways, then I couldn't make a living. It just wouldn't work. So what we are seeing right now, the GameStop phenomena is actually unprecedented. We haven't actually seen that in the history of markets in the sense that usually what would happen is that when in the past, there is some stock that is shorted a lot. GameStop is a company that has a very large short position. And the short position could be justified because this is a business that has been in secular decline for a very long time. So video games used to be very non-online. You'd, you'd go to the GameStop store, you'd swap different games, you'd get the console, and everything was around a physical store. And now most of those games, those are downloads, you pay, play remotely, you play it on your phone, so it has disrupted their core business model quite heavily. And they may have a very difficult time in the future making their business profitable or make it work because uh, the paradigm has shifted. So clearly the people who shorted, so just taking a step back, it is a very dumb activity to short stocks. When you short a stock, your maximum upside is a double. So some stock is worth $100 and I think it's worth zero, for example. So I could borrow the shares from my broker, from somebody else, and I owe them 
one share of hundred dollars back. Now that share eventually goes to one dollar. So I sell it. I borrow the shares. I sell it. Then later, when it's down at one dollar, I buy it back and I return the share and I pocket the ninety-nine dollar difference. Okay. So that's typically how short selling works when it works. The problem is when it goes the other way. So if I borrow the share at hundred dollars, and it ends up being priced at five hundred dollars, for example. So I would, when I'm trying to close out my short position, I'd have to buy the shares back at 500 and then return them and I'd have a $400 loss. So in short selling, there's an asymmetry where your maximum loss possibility is infinite and the maximum gain possibility is a double. Just from those metrics alone, one should never short. Why would you want to go bankrupt if you're wrong and just make a double if you're right? But nobody listens to me. And definitely the people with the big hedge funds don't listen to me. So I have never shorted a stock in my life. I will go to my grave without ever having shorted a stock. It's not because I don't consider many things overvalued. I do find many things overvalued in the market. But I have no ability to predict when or how those overvaluations would adjust. If something is overvalued, there is nothing that prevents it from getting even more overvalued. So uh, I haven't been watching the game stock price as we've been speaking. Where is the stock at right now? Can someone tell me where game stocks at? Yes, as of this moment, it's at three hundred and three dollars, one hundred and four percent on the back. Yeah. So in the online chatter I was reading last night, there were a bunch of gung ho guys talking about taking it to a thousand today. That was their objective. Let's take it to a thousand. And they are hell bent on wiping out one or more hedge funds. And if the hedge funds actually have a short position, not a put option, but a short position, and they haven't already covered, and that was a significant short position, I think they are in very serious trouble. So when I look at the market today, we have this weird thing going on with a few heavily shorted stocks that are rising because, so this has not happened before. In the past, what has happened is there has been collusion. So collusion is actually illegal. So if I were to form a group with a bunch of people and say, we're going to just keep buying these shares and make the short sellers sweat it out, make the shares go up really high, and then when it gets to some ridiculous number, then we'll you know, sell our shares and whatever. In the meantime, the short seller has gone bankrupt. There are laws against that. But what is happening on Reddit and what is happening on Wall Street bets is protected, I think protected by free speech. And it's not a group that is colluding because they don't know each other. They're not really particularly trying to, but it's a virtual group. It is in effect a group. I'm curious how the SEC deals with this because now they've discovered something which actually breaks down market mechanisms. Market mechanisms stop working in these types of situations. It is in general, even if you short stocks, in general, it is very stupid to be shorting stocks that are heavily shorted. So that's like playing with fire. So if you want to go short, you could short an index that's safer or a basket of stocks, but or stocks that don't have large short interest. But I think stocks like GameStop, BlackBerry, and a few others who are going crazy, it's not good. So when I look at the markets, okay, so one part of the market is these very small number of heavily shorted stocks where there's a distortion. And if I were you, we can get our popcorn and watch from the sidelines and entertain ourselves, that's fine. When we get past these stocks into some of the Robin Hood names, the Teslas of the world and so on, we do have bubble-esque characteristics there. I think the game stocks have gone beyond bubbles. It is just, these are mega bubbles. Tesla clearly in bubble territory, according to me. So there's about, I would say, maybe 10 or 15 names of businesses that have gone crazy on valuations driven by the Robin Hood phenomena and such. 
But when we get past all that, once we get the past the 10, 15 names, beyond that, then it's not clear to me that markets are overvalued. They do seem to be richly valued, but if interest rates stay really low for a long time, you could justify those valuations. So it's an interesting market because you have, I think there's clearly a bubble in SPACs. There's a bubble in these heavily shorted stocks. There's a bubble in the Robinhood names. And, but beyond all of that, I think I'm not sure there are bubbles everywhere. So do you think that if the SEC deems that, that this kind of online phenomenon is, is legal, that, I'm sorry, that hedge funds will kind of not really feel like this with their time short and just kind of abandon it altogether? Do you think that this will kill shorting as a mechanism? Yeah, I think the, the, I'm pretty sure GameStop has the attention of the people at the SEC. Of course, they've, we've just had an election. The commissioners just changed. So there's a new guard that's feeling its way through the system, if you will. They haven't been there for very, very long. And they are probably at this point trying to figure out what exactly is the right course of action over here. There are a number of things that are going on here which are unprecedented. It is not obvious that there's anything going on that in terms of current laws is illegal. And uh, the SEC could take actions, which could they could do a longer term halt on trading, but those sorts of things have very negative impact, impacts on market participants. So I think, I, I think the SEC is probably torn in terms of exactly what action would be the correct one. So to some extent, there could be an argument made that you let the market work this out because there were dumb people in hedge funds who did these dumb things and they should face the music that comes from their actions. And, and so, so I'm not exactly sure where this will go, but I'm pretty sure the regulators are very carefully looking at what's going on. Hey, Adrian, thank you for coming. I, I wanted to ask quickly, I've been hearing a lot about impact investing, ESG investing. I was wondering if that factors into uh, your thought process at all with valuations and seeing different metrics that aren't typically included come into how you look at companies. You're asking about impact investing? Correct. Yes, I'm of the frame of mind that it's better to separate capitalism from doing good in the world. Sometimes you can do both, but it's difficult to serve two, two masters. So I, I feel that when one is investing, one should focus on delivering returns and making good investments. And, and those, those should be the primary focus. Now, the thing is that I won't invest in some things. For example, I don't think I would invest in a tobacco company, but I have invested in the past in a liquor company, for example. And I've definitely invested in the past in companies that pump a lot of carbon into the atmosphere, for example. Most car companies do that. So I think it, it becomes a slippery slope when you're trying to look at, you cannot optimize two variables. You can really optimize one variable. And I think as an investor, what you ought to do is focus on the investments and the returns. You could draw some kind of limits. Like I'm not overly eager to invest in casinos or sports betting and that sort of thing, or state lotteries and such. But others could say that's fine, and I really wouldn't have a big argument against it. The same with tobacco. Others could say it's fine, and I wouldn't have a big argument against that. But I think a better model is to just uh, separate the two, is uh, focus on investing by itself, and the impact you want to create, you can do that on the philanthropic side. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions, both online or in person? Yeah, I actually have a quick question for you. Um, what are you expecting, like the outlook of the market in the next year? Um, I know I've kind of been feeling like there's going to be a dip, but that's also been kind of what everyone's been feeling for the past year. Do you think the market kind of stays on its trajectory that it's on, or what are you kind of anticipating? Yeah, that's a good question, Nicholas. Uh, I've actually never really paid attention to what might happen in markets. In, and one year is a very short time 
or even over multi-year periods. So I run a very concentrated portfolio. I don't have any short positions. By the time you get to my sixth or seventh position, we are talking about 80% or more of the portfolio. So what matters is what happens to those businesses. So the micro will trump the macro. I don't ever look at macro circumstances, who's the president, which fam, which party controls Congress. I think those are irrelevant data points from my point of view. What I focus on is, number one, the businesses that I'm interested in. Do I understand those businesses well? What are the future prospects of those businesses? And how do I think those businesses will perform long-term? So I'll give you a I'll give you an example. In 2019, middle of 2019, I was in Istanbul in Turkey, and I had made a few trips to to Turkey in the last few years and met with several dozen publicly traded Turkish companies. And um, towards the end of my trip, I met with one particular company, and I was really blown away with the numbers and the quality of the people and all of that, it was quite interesting. Now, at that time in July, 2019, the general macro scene in Turkey was that the currency was highly unstable. It was likely to go through significant devaluation. The leadership in the country left a lot to be desired and foreign investors were exiting en masse. They were just bailing out. The business I was looking at, so there there are many businesses, but I'll just put it simply to you. So this is a company that is the largest operator of warehouses in Turkey. They have 12 million square feet of warehouses, about two and a half million of it is refrigerated. Their clients are like Amazon, Alibaba, Carrefour, Ikea. They've got like a blue chip client base. 99% of their warehouses are leased on long-term leases. They usually sign 10-year leases. And if the warehouse is rented to a multinational, usually the lease is in euros and they got two, 3% annual escalators. If it's rented to a Turkish company, they usually have inflation indexed rents increasing every year based on inflation. So the, you could buy the entire company at that time in July for about $40 million. And so if you take the 12 million square feet and divide it by the 40 million, you are paying less than three and a half dollars a foot for prime long-term leased warehouses to class A tenants. And so you were paying, let's say, and actually if you bought the holding company, it was less than $3, but let's say we were buying this at $3 a foot. There was debt on these properties, which was about $17 a foot. So you had about $17 a foot of debt. You had $3 of basically embedded equity value. And the liquidation value of these assets was at least around $60 a square foot, $50, $60 a square foot. On a bad day, you could sell it for $50 a square foot. So you could liquidate this whole company and basically you'd pay off the debt and for every $3 you put in, you would get about $33 or 11 times your money. But that wasn't even the most interesting part of this for me. The father-son team that ran this business were exceptionally grifted capital allocators. And they had done a number of things I'd seen in the past where they were very smart about how they were allocating capital. So I could see that if I was paying $40 million for this company and it was worth maybe four or $500 million, that if I look far enough in the future, maybe five or 10 years from now, it would be worth a lot more than the four or 500 million because they would be doing things that would add value beyond the liquidation value of the business. We, after we had kicked the tires and done the work to assure ourselves that this wasn't any fraudulent, anything we're looking at, I spent an afternoon visiting all the warehouses and so on. We started buying the stock. And at that time, I told you that people were mass 
leaving Turkey, we ended up getting enough stock where now we own one third of the company. It's the largest position we own in terms of percentage ownership of a company. And since we invested, the Turkish lira collapsed by 40%. So it went down just like people said it would go down. It went down quite a bit. To me, it did not matter if the currency used in Turkey was seashells or dollars or Turkish lira. It didn't matter what the currency was. It didn't matter how much it devalued. At the end of the day, those warehouses had a global value. They were prime properties in a prime metropolitan area and so on. So even though we suffered a 40% devaluation in dollar terms, between then and now, we are up about six or seven times what we paid. And we have not sold. We have no plans to sell. I told you about this change in mindset about thinking as an owner. The father-son team have done a number of things in the last year and a half, which have actually increased the value of the business, things that I didn't even have on my radar. So in making that investment, it never crossed my mind what is happening with GameStop or what is happening with Tesla or what is happening with the Fed or who's going to be the next president or what is going to happen to markets in the next 12 months. None of that is relevant. What is relevant is how well does the management team in this company run this business? That is all that matters here. And that's, I think, how one ought to look at a business. So if you were going to buy a McDonald's in Clemson and someone wanted to sell it, what you'd be focused on is how has that McDonald's performed in the last few years? What kind of cash flows it's produced? What are the demographics of Clemson looking like for the next few years? And not much else beyond that would matter. And it would be the price is reasonable. You could make a go at it. If it's unreasonable, you would take a pass. So that's how I look at the investment. I have no idea what markets will do in the next 12 months, and I really don't care. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Marsh. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, I have one more for you. So along the lines of currency, we were just talking, uh, Bitcoin has been gaining incredible steam recently. I was wondering what your opinions are on that, and if you view that as a legitimate currency or just another speculative bubble. Yeah. So the thing is that 99% of the stuff that goes on in this world, I do not understand. And that's perfectly fine because I only need to understand things that I actually invest in. If you were to ask me, I only have two choices, buy Bitcoin or sell Bitcoin, I would not want to be holding Bitcoin. I think that there are a number of speculative elements associated with it. And there are people who believe in it big time but Bitcoin also has some very interesting nuances, which I like. I read some stories recently of some people who lost hundreds of millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin because they lost their password. And they couldn't get 10 attempts, and they made eight attempts, and after the 10th attempt, it would, it would lock up permanently. And in one case, someone's hard disk, which had all his Bitcoin, accidentally ended up in a landfill in the UK, I don't know if you guys heard that story. And he had about 280 million of Bitcoin in that hard drive that is now in some landfill in the UK. So he offered $70 million to the landfill owners to give him a month to dig in that landfill. Okay, so, you know, it kind of, it's kind of a little funny. I guess we've had the same thing with gold, right? And you have a ship loaded with gold and it sinks. And for all practical purposes, that gold is lost forever. Till 200 years later, someone finds it or whatever. So even though they claim Bitcoin is safe and you know all this stuff, you have weird things like that going on where you kind of have to scratch your head. But uh, yeah, I've looked at it a little bit. There's nothing that I had found that excites me about putting my assets into Bitcoin. So I would just say that we just talked about Turkey. We talked to the warehouses. I talked about that the medium of exchange could be seashells in Turkey. And those warehouses would still have value. 
so the money is a is not a is a mechanism to create liquidity for all of us to have a easier time buying and selling goods and services it has value based on the relative value we ascribe to it in our transactions as we go about it and bitcoin is no different so it could have some value as a medium of exchange but to say that a bitcoin is going to be worth 5 million dollars at some point i think defies logic so in my little brain i cannot figure it out and there are lots of things my little brain cannot figure out it's okay i don't need to go long or short there thank you one more question Hi, I have a quick question about something that you mentioned earlier. You said that the year of 2020 was a great year of growth and learning for you. What would you say were some of your biggest takeaways or lessons that you learned and how does that affect the way that you invest now versus maybe in the past? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mentioned my friend uh, Nick Sleep and in fact I'm just going to do a search to see if it, his letters are there so I can tell you whether I'm whether I, I always worry whether they're taken down or not yeah so i think if you do a google search just uh, next sleep letters it'll bring up some links which will give you all his letters i think those are like the dead sea scrolls they should be required reading so he ran a fund from 2001 to 2014 the entire thing is in a single pdf and I, what i would do is i would start with the oldest letters and then work my way forward and i think it would be a tremendous education to go through that So just to give you a little bit of the cliff notes version of the next leap letters is Nick understood this notion really well that when you find great businesses with great runways run by great managements that you take the mindset of an owner and not an investor so in 2013 when he was just before he shut down his funds he was running about 3 billion dollars in capital and 40% of the capital was invested in amazon so about 1.2 billion was in amazon stock and then costco and berkshire hathaway made up almost the rest of the portfolio so 90% of the portfolio was amazon costco and berkshire hathaway okay that's how he was running his portfolio the uk regulators were giving him a lot of grief saying you cannot have all this risk in a portfolio with so much money in one position and that you need to diversify and it went against every bone in his body because he understood amazon really well he did not want to change even 10 years from now his amazon position because he understood that business was exceptional at that time in 2014 amazon was 300 dollars a share now it's 3300 or more than that So what he did in with his partner Zach is he wrote to his investors saying look I'm returning all your capital I'm shutting down my funds we've had a good run they compounded at about 20% a year for 14 years and uh, Nick and his partner I'm get, estimating got maybe a, somewhere between 100 and 200 million each from all the fees and gains and such that they had made and they kept their stake in these three companies so for example if nick got 100 million half of it was in amazon and maybe the rest of it is berkshire and costco and he kept it that way and you can imagine what that did to his net worth it's worked out very well and uh, he pretty much outperformed almost any manager i know of and with doing no he's been driving these race cars on race tracks he's taking long bike rides he's go skiing he's not doing much work i would say in terms of actual work i don't know maybe 100 hours a year or something so the learning from him was that when you identify and find these exceptional great businesses which have very high returns on equity very long runways very great managers very deep moats you go all in and ideally you try to find them small and then it's set it and forget it and it's similar to what this book in 1972 came out talks about the 100 to 1 in stock market returns i think even though the book is 48 years old i think it's timeless 
So I think these were the big lessons for me, which is I was always an investor who said, okay, find an undervalued asset and sell it at full price. Like for example, when I bought our investment in Turkey, I said, okay, this is very undervalued. We'll have a good run at some point, we'll move on. I don't think about it that way anymore. We own one third of, those, of that business, which means that out of the 12 million square feet, 4 million square feet belongs to us, my fund investors. I like that business. The managers are really good. And we will keep that business for a long time. And so that's a completely different mindset from what I had before when I was trying to do these precise calculations of intrinsic value and all of that. We're not doing that. So that's the big change. Are there any other questions out there? Manish, with that, with that change in your thinking, what are you doing with all your time now that you're not having to uh, do all the, the analysis that you were doing? There is always analysis because the portfolio is like an aircraft carrier. It was positioned a certain way, let's say in 2019 or middle of 2020, and it's, I'm moving it into a different direction. So the movement to a different direction, which is where we eventually end up with a bunch of great compounders, that will take a few years. So we've started to make some investments, but these are not overnight because we've got, we're in effect, we're pregnant with a bunch of positions and we have to let those play out. So I think in the next few years, we'll probably get the aircraft carrier positioned correctly. And then once we are there, then yeah, it should be just uh, monitoring those businesses a little bit and then look at what's on the horizon. In any way, in any case, I always think of myself as a gentleman of leisure. My, my job is reading and thinking. So that doesn't change. It'll always be reading and thinking. All right, we're just about to run out of time, so I think we're going to wrap this up. Thank you so much, Monish, for all your insightful knowledge. Uh, this was a great, great presentation. Mm-hmm.